Hi, Axel. Hi, Adam. Uh, what a pleasure to uh, to see you again. Yeah, a long, long time, actually. The last time we saw each other, I think it was in Warsaw. Yeah, is a conference at the airport. Do you oh, remember this? Good memory, yeah. That's ages ago. It must be uh, eight, eight years ago, maybe. or, or yeah, yeah, something yeah. like this, yeah. Long while. But even farther back, what was your first computer? Ooh, um, my, uh, when I was about uh, 10 years old, my parents bought a clone of an X86, uh, of an 8086. So that was about 640Ks of RAM and uh, uh, just under 4 megahertz of uh, CPU power with a massive 32 megabyte hard disk and uh, both a... Uh, three and a half and a five and a quarter inch floppy drive. So those were the days. Which year was it, roughly? This must be around 1990, I think. Uh, 89 or 90, something like that. Okay, this makes sense. Because I started a little bit earlier, maybe 86. And I don't think that in this year PCs were around. Not 8086. Because I think they came a little bit later. But uh, around 89, 8080 or something, they were the first PCs I saw. And before that, it's interesting. I, I will have to look it up. When 8086 came around, because I got this later, I bought a machine, maybe it was 94, something like this. And I um, I used one, really cheap one, but a lot of fun with it. But it was, um, but I, yeah, interesting. Um, I had that set spectrum, by the way. So um, this is why uh, uh, PCs, I was interested, but they were, I think they came a little bit later. It would be interesting to see. What you did with the machine? What was your first action? So you plugged the power on and what then you started to program java yeah. or what no, uh, java. well technically <laughs> it wasn't mine i was still a, a, a 10 year old boy at the time so I, it was my parents computer but i was okay. uh, i was quite lucky because a year or two before a father of a friend of mine from elementary school at the time was getting into um, programming himself so this was still very early days this was the the 80s so um, most uh, uh, of the world hadn't gone digital yet so he um he was doing that as a job and he offered me and a bunch of other uh friends from school to teach us some GW basic at the time. So this is something huh. really obscure with line numbers under DOS and it's a it's a very different era. Uh but that basically got me started and that's uh uh how I had my first little steps on my little diskette that I had there and I used that with uh, with the computer at the time. Yeah, I also learned GW Basic at school later, and I th remember the PC was this was strange. It was from AEG, the company, the German company AEG. You know, I guess. yes, yes, I do. Yeah, yeah, I think they exited that market a long time ago now. But uh, yes, they was. Uh... And this, uh, I forgot. If, I knew even the name what GW stands for, but I also learned it. But for me, it was a little bit nicer. Basic. So this basic I knew it was more primitive than the GW Basic. I would say. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what you did with the GW Basic, or uh, it was uh, very simple stuff. I mean, it, these were really my my very first steps into um, um, getting familiar with what a computer was and what it could do. So we um, um, we developed some simple little things like simple games, like guess a number, and the computer would pick a random number, and then you enter a guess, and it would say yeah. higher or lower, and until you finally mm -hmm. uh, guess the number. So very, very simple things at the time, but that was great because it got. Um, it got the uh, the mind uh, set up for the kind of thinking that we, we would need later in our careers as well for solving problems and analyzing things. So I, I actually really enjoyed that time. And and, and you didn't start to play back then? So you, you, you started programming right away? Mm, well, uh, I did have a, a games console at the time. I had something called the Sega Master System, which is uh, oh, okay. also some ancient piece of technology. And on the computer, there were some games, but everything was much more primitive than uh, what the game console could uh, could do at the time. So, yes, there were some games, like uh, things like Alley Cat, you may remember some very early 1980s games. or um, And then eventually, I think the, the most advanced game I got on that computer was uh, The Secret of Monkey Island, which I really enjoyed okay. and spent countless hours uh, on. Is Sega still around as a game console? Oh, uh, they um they got into trouble in the nineties. I, I think they um they basically they miscalculated or they, there was a lot of like, internal chaos uh, after the the Mega Drive. They then basically uh, with the Saturn 
competing divisions between Sega of Japan and Sega of, uh, of America basically caused them to um, make a huge mess, lost a huge amount of market share. And by the time the Dreamcast came around in the early 2000s, that was basically the end of the uh, run in the console market. They couldn't catch up with the PlayStation anymore. And, and that was that. So they're just licensing their titles uh, these days to... Nintendo and a bunch of other companies. Yeah, well, this is what, what I remember because, you know, in the arcades back then, there was also Sega, you know, the logo on the... Uh, so this is what I remember. I never had the console, but uh, I liked the... This was Capcom, you know, Sega, what else? Uh, uh, this oh, was, yeah, this I spent right? way too much uh, money on Daytona USA as well in the 90s. That was, uh, that was a lot of fun, all those, uh, all those okay. games. Okay, cool. So so you like programming then? So you spend more time programming than with C Sega or what was another relation between... Oh, it's uh, your Sega time and GW basic <laughs> good time. Good question. Good question. Uh, I don't know. It's a long time ago. It's about uh, uh, it's more than thirty years uh, back. So I don't know what the exact re uh, relationship was in terms of time. Programming took a lot longer than it was today as well because there was no internet. There was nothing to uh, yeah. uh, where you could look up things when there was no Stack Overflow. So it was a lot of trial and error. Uh, you had to keep on trying and then very often sometimes the whole machine crashed and you had to reboot it so it just took a, a lot longer but we had less distractions either there was no youtube and no cell phone and no other things to keep you busy so we had much longer um uh, attention spans or 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 uh, or blocks of uninterrupted time where we could focus on those things yeah but uh, I have to say, I will uh, try to be really cautious with my time without, you know, any cell phones or whatever, and it still goes way too fast, right? This is this is my problem. Maybe it's also yours. Everything is just too interesting. Even if there's longer attention spans right now, you know, there is uh, just time flies. That's the problem. Yeah, I think we, uh, well, the world of, uh, certainly the world of programming has gotten so much larger and there's so many more avenues being explored. And in the, in the 1980s, it was still more or less possible to know everything like the number of machines was very limited at least in the pc space yeah. uh, the hardware the software there were very few abstractions you could could really know a lot and now these days it's just so specialized and so many different avenues you can go and explore so yes it's uh, you have to make conscious choices of, of saying no and not going down every rabbit hole these days yeah this is why i stick with java it's still fun there's still no time so that's <laughs> that's the problem Hey, uh, what happens with GW, GW Basic trajectory? So you stick with GW Basic, what you develop, or what was the maybe most impressive GW Basic app you wrote or, or program? Oh, or I don't think there was anything very impressive uh, back then. Or uh, complicated. Not, not much more than um, uh, than the uh, than the little games and the things I wrote you about. There, were, um, there was also something in the 1980s which has completely disappeared now, but you used to be able to buy those books that had printed listings of games that you could type yeah. and copy over and then you could search for hours for the one typo that you missed somewhere. And So uh, yeah. I had a lot of fun with those as a kid, but uh, I didn't stick with GW. Hey, you managed you, you manage to, to be successful because I, as I remember, I was not able to, to write anything from the magazines, you know, to, to make it run. Maybe my computer was slightly different, so, but it, it was really hard, you know, to be... Because there was no persistence. I could store it on a, on, on, a, on a tape, but it was not that easy. So it was really hard to be, to, to, to be successful just typing, you know, the, or the listing from books and magazines. Oh, it right? was terrible. It was terrible. I had lots of practice in uh, playing the games, you know, spot the 10 differences between these two images. Yeah. And then this guy has a beard over there and the feather on his hat. And that was very helpful to kind of see which character I may have missed <laughs> while copying things over. But, but it was really terrible. It was, uh, yeah. But those were the days yeah. and that's what we had at the time. And it was fun. So that, that was good. It was fun. It was a, a, I was a lot of fun, right? It was like a, a, a magical world for me back then, right? So, so closed magical world. Oh, I, I couldn't agree more. It was, uh, it, it was a real sense of uh, infinite possibilities that you just had to tap yeah. into, and everything seemed possible. Yes, it was, it was great. As a, as a kid, it was, it was incredible. So, what, what happened? After GW Basic, what was your next language? Well, we uh, we moved up the ladder just slightly because technology moved forward quite a bit. So, uh, so the the next step was uh, Quick Basic, which was already very nice because then we got rid of line numbers. There was some built-in editor, and uh, that was that was very nice. So I stuck with that for 
uh, a little while and then quickly moved on to Turbo Pascal, which is... Uh, which and Quick Basic was QBasic, it was the same, right? QBasic and Quick correct, Basic was correct. the same? So uh, QBasic okay. was bundled with MS-DOS uh, 5.0 at the time, uh, but didn't have the mm -hmm. ability to generate uh, XE files. And Quick Basic okay. was uh, independent, uh, probably got a pirated copy of that at the, the time that basically uh, uh, did let you produce an EXE and then you could run it on the DOS without needing the interpreter to, uh, to be around. Okay, so what you did then with QBasic or Quick Basic? So, um, yes, what interests me, what you wanted to achieve back then? So, why you started the program just in order to, 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 to play games? So, what is your goal? Well, why? I think that there was no real goal in itself. There was a bit of thinkering at the time. The, in the QBasic days, we're still kind of uh, figuring out what we can do and playing around. It was a um, part of a discovery journey. Um, later on, it kind of changed. When uh, um, when I picked up Turbo Pascal, I also uh, got my first exposure to Assembler because you can embed some Assembler in Turbo Pascal. So getting to build a bit more about the machine and how that worked. And then there were different motivations, uh, uh, like um, um, because, uh, of course, as a, as a kid, I didn't have any money and uh, most of the games I, uh, I couldn't afford. So uh, um, breaking the copy protection of some games by learning Assembler and introducing no up instructions where they uh, uh, they would kind of go and check the license key or something was uh, was uh, was a different motivation that I got in the in the years after that. But uh, yes, nothing spectacular at all in in those days. Yeah, but this was already spectacular. I mean, if as a kid plays with Pascal and Assembly, you know, uh, I mean, this is extremely spectacular right now. Well, no? um, as I said, lots of time and lots of time to think here, and uh, there were some motivations, especially. Um, uh, I, I enjoyed Lemmings a lot, also in the nineties, and, oh, okay. uh, and being and being get, being able to get rid of that copy protection was a big motivation to uh, be able to play that more on the computer at home. So that's. Uh, I remember Lemmings. They were like small creatures, and there were some suicidal tendencies. Yes, they had, yes, right? they, no? yeah. they most certainly did. You had to uh, protect them from themselves and uh, get them safely to ah, the exit yeah, exactly. of the level. Yes. Okay. Uh, one question regarding two Pascal and assembly. Maybe you remember, but. Uh, you could load from Turbo Pascal assembly code? Uh, you could embed it, actually. So you could, uh, there was, uh, if I remember correctly, there were, there were some special constructs in the language where uh, within that block, it would then be assembly, and then you could use that. Uh, and you could call then this this thing and pass parameters and return values? Or... Oh, it's a, it's a long time back, but yes, I think there was some interaction that you could certainly do between the Pascal code and the assembly code, there were some limitations in the registers you were allowed to modify and some which you basically had to keep your hands off because otherwise it would confuse well, uh, whatever uh, the compiler had yeah. created around it. Um, but then, yeah, the, you could definitely interact and I think you could pass some variables, but oof, this is this is 30 years uh, ago, so I'm not, not entirely sure anymore. No, it's just interesting because we have a similar problem in JavaScript right now, where is web assembly in JavaScript. It's also interesting, you know, always interesting to me how the language interacts with the web assembly or whatever you call it, assembly or, or machine code or whatever. And whether there's a routine like, you know, in Java, what was this? Uh, load, uh, what is it called? Load library, right? The native code, DLL, and then it's loaded and you can do something with it. Yeah, interesting. So, um, and okay, so... You use Turbo Pascal and uh, Assembly to play Lemmings, basically, right? Those were main motivation. So, what happened afterwards? So, what was you know uh, <laughs> after your successful Lemming Lemmings uh, so in the, um, experience? In the early nineties, around ninety four, ninety five, we had this thing which um, came and is now long gone as well, called the Cyber Cafe, and they had the very first Cyber Cafe in the world in London uh, called Siberia, and we went with a trip with cool name, pardon. Yeah, cool yeah, name, yeah, by was, the way. I, it was, uh, and I'd read about it in some paper or I heard it on the radio, I don't know. And um, I was living in with my parents in Brussels at the time, so this is not very far from London. So we uh, we went over there as uh, children one uh, one weekend, and uh, then I got to play a little with that. And this was the first real contact with the internet. Um, it was mm -hmm. still uh, Windows uh, 3.11, some uh, very old version of Netscape. And then you could, this this was a uh, a giant leap again in, in my mind of all of a sudden, like, this is insane. Like we're, we're sitting here in London, we're typing in this browser something which is magically sending it maybe across the ocean 
to get some hard disk, maybe somewhere in America, spinning, and then it's sending it all back in a second, and it's rendering this page very slow and very primitive at the time. This was this was just incredible. And then through that, I um, eventually about a year or so later, um, the um, uh, we had a computer at home where we could then dial into some ISP, and we had a modem, and we had some things, and. The, then gradually I got exposed to applets as a, as a user at first. And then, well, that seemed very magical that you could just deploy yeah. code like that that could do, uh, well, simple things, but still very spectacular at the time. So that was, uh, that was really what got me interested in um, the JVM at the time and, and beginning to tinker and how does it work and, uh, and you're not building machine code directly. What is this bytecode thing? How do you run that? How does that work? How do you package it? So that, that, was, uh, that was really, uh, I'd say, the, the next big step there to, uh, to kind of see what, uh, what the world of programming had to offer. So you started with Tua Pascal and then the next language was Java? Um, correct. There was a small intermediate uh, thing which was Delphi, which is basically the uh, yeah. which was the GUI version of uh, Turbo Pascal for for Windows. So that that was very interesting as well because this was the first exposure to object orientation. They had uh, a, a Turbo Pascal only had a con uh, the concept of structs and rather simple data structures and some methods. And now all of a sudden there were objects and classes, and you uh, you could uh, inherit and um, you could overload, and so there were a bunch of very interesting new concepts I had to learn in my programming journey there to wrap my head around that, and then I could find those concepts again uh, then in the, um, in the Java world after. Delphi was, of course, also spectacular in terms of productivity. In the 90s, it was magical. You could just visually draw your form and put all the controls and connect them and then add a little bit of glue code in the event handlers, and it would generate an EXE, and it would work, and there I could, um, I made some simple things for me. I had some wallpaper switcher and a few things for my desktop. Just little little utilities like that that I enjoyed uh, making with that. So that was uh, that was good fun for for that. And then and then the internet came along. Tua Pascal was huge and Delphi as well. Delphi or Delphi. So I, there were lots of enthusiasts. And even though at the Java conference, there's still people who you know met people which uh, who were big into Delphi, especially the relation between Tua Pascal, Delphi, and Boland. They also uh, liked really the the Boland company, who uh, I think was behind Delphi as well, right? So uh, it was uh, Delphi was uh, the Boland was behind, and the uh, um, environment, at least the IDE, was the most famous one. Was from Boland Delphi. And then became JBuilder. No, it became there was another product called JBuilder. But I'm actually impressed that you started with Java that early, because I I I was aware of you uh, as I said so around maybe 2017 or 16. If you started with Flyway DB, and before that, I don't think we ever met, right? So uh, it's just like uh, or I think it's, well. Um, we're skipping a few years here, but uh, yeah, uh, Flyway really um, started in 2010. So that's uh, uh, so, okay. And that, um, um, yeah, we we must have met a few years after because I only started speaking at conferences uh, shortly around that time as well. And it was probably three or four years in um, when I okay. moved up from some local Java user groups to maybe the JAX conferences and a few others that we may have uh, run. That you in Warsaw more, but it was 2015 or something around that. So this is where you mm -hmm. met. Okay, interesting. So you, you liked applets and, and you liked Java as well. And you say, okay, Delphi is just better. So what was, uh, this was interesting. So you, 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 you knew Delphi first, then you saw Java. Was Java better, easier or what? You know, what was your impression? Oh, it was... It was much worse in a whole bunch of respects. Uh, um, the Delphi story uh, was really fantastic. When you think about it, you had, um, you had incredible productivity uh, for building something graphical. Uh, you had an incredible deployment story on your local machine where you could have a self-contained mm -hmm. EXE with no dependencies on external libraries, no runtime required. So that was, that was really fantastic. But the one advantage where it couldn't compete was uh, that you couldn't deliver it uh, over the internet uh, through a browser. There were some efforts later, um, but but still, this was really uh, incredible. And so, what Java there brought to the table was 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 the world of the internet that uh, 
was very different from the the '90s desktop world that I had there. But but we did lose a lot in the process, and we we only regained it much later in terms of uh, um, ease of packaging and deployment and all that. I think the uh, the dark ages of the application servers really set us back a long time in in being able to easily deploy things and and just have something nice. And and these days we kind of get back at that with containers and, and just simple self-contained solutions that we can move around easily. Be careful. I really like the application. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not afraid to break some eggs. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> no, no kidding. So um, I, I use them pragmatically and really like them, still like them. And uh, right now I'm using Quarkus and Halidon and they have very similar experience, uh, better developer experience, maybe a bit, but uh, yeah. Um, another talk, but um, what's... Um, so, so you started with applets and you stick with Java. Did you something you know professionally with Java or, or was just fun at the beginning? Well, I um, so I wasn't working yet at the time. I was still a teenager um, when I started. So they were. Um, it was mostly for fun. Some experiments. I had some little games I developed. Some, uh, but rather rather simple. But it was my first really dabbing into the graphics APIs and do a few things. It was still very very primitive with what you could do with it. AWT Swing wasn't even around in the beginning. Of yeah. Which is very simple, um, but then eventually in um, in ninety uh, ninety eight, I um, I got a job and there I uh, um, began developing professionally for uh, for Java the, uh, in Java the year after, and that's how I slowly kind of um, moved from just purely being a hobbyist and tinkering around at home to actually uh, uh, building a, a programming career from there. What you did in 1998, what was what kind of job was it? I suppose e-commerce, right? Um, no, it wasn't. E uh, well, what, what was the first uh, project? So I, um, I, it seems like a previous life. It's a long time ago, but I, uh, I worked for uh, IBM Global Services at the time. Um, and wow. they, um, they had a bunch of customers where basically it was customer projects where these people were getting their systems online for the first time. They were digitizing a lot of processes. They had done manually so it was with business software. Um, it was uh, yeah a combination of very simple, the early versions of servlets and those technologies mm -hmm. uh, that uh, that we got there. Yeah, so that. Yeah, cool. And 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 you studied actually computer science or no? I um I didn't really study. I um. I uh, forest gump my way into into things. So basically, I uh, at the end of the nineties, I um I moved. To, I did my last year of high school or grade twelve or uh, in uh, in Canada. And when I came back to Belgium, um, there were still some exams that you uh, that I uh, that I hadn't passed for grade twelve because the basically the level of schooling is very different between uh, between Belgium and Canada. It was too low in Canada, so what I did there didn't count in Belgium. I had to kind of repeat some exams there. And they, um, uh, they have this thing, once you're, um, once you're past the age of normal high school, you, can, you don't have to sit in class with uh, young kids. So you can basically just pass the exams on your own twice a year, either at Christmas or in June. And they had this thing there. So basically the next uh, thing was in... Uh, uh, Christmas when I came back and then I thought well it's just it's easy it's just a couple of exams and not just going to sit around half a year at home so I opened something called the yellow pages at the time and in the yellow pages I flicked through a little bit and then I thought ah, oh, IBM they do something with computers maybe I'll give them a call and I did and I got a job and that's that so I never studied. Hey it's actually a great story so um, because um you can study, but you don't have to, right? So you can, you can actually learn whatever you like. So this is uh, this was I was interested because um, you are very skilled. That was actually, okay. You are working for IBM. What happened before? So um, you kept working for IBM for how long? So I worked for IBM until about two thousand and five, I think. Uh, probably a bit longer than I should have. Uh, um, I came in with a very low salary because I was just eighteen years old. I uh, didn't really know what I was doing, but. Um, I um I did have the um, the occasion to take a, a few breaks. We had a, a great system at the time, um, which allowed you to take in your whole career up to twenty four months of leave. But you could use them for whatever. You could go studying. You could take care of your family. You could do whatever you want. And I used that time to go traveling. And so I um I went traveling a little bit when I was twenty twenty one for a half a year in Australia, and then I took another half a year off in 2004 2005 to go and travel around south america and that's 
where I met my wife, who's from uh, Germany, from mm -hmm. Munich. And then eventually we sponsored the airlines for a year. I thought, you know, that's not sustainable. I'll just move to Germany, love German. And that's that. So uh, that's, that was a, a good occasion to um, leave the job at IBM behind and, and move on. We advise young listeners to, to do it, to travel for half a year around the world or whatever. Well, it depends what you're into. Um, for me, it's something I, uh, I really enjoyed. It's, um, I feel it's a special time. Your 20s, uh, you haven't got family, you haven't got that many responsibilities yet. It will only get harder to be able to travel. And yes, somebody focusing purely on their career we may get a little bit ahead. But is that so important at the end of the day? I think each and every one has to decide for themselves what they think is worth it there. But in my case, I thought it was fantastic. Like the life experiences yeah, there were mm -hmm. just, just great. As a, I'd say if you, mm -hmm. if you feel like it, do it. So, um, okay, what happened? So, wh why you, so you quit IBM because you had to move to, to Germany, right? Correct, this correct. Was the, to a bit that. overdue. I okay. uh, should have probably done it before. But uh, yes, this was like the final straw and that, that was great. And you did the entire time Java at IBM? Yes. It was uh, Java all the right. time, uh, different customer products. And, and what, what was the range from servlets to application servers, WebSphere? What yes, was yes, your... it was uh, WebSphere. And then even, um, in the beginning, uh, we still had this IDE called Visual Age for Java, a very uh, yeah. obscure uh, thing. Um, they did have some very interesting uh, properties that we only regained much later in other IDEs. Like all the code was compiled all the time and ready to run and you can yeah. run broken code as well. And so that worked very well. So in terms of productivity, they had some very weird quirks in terms of version control and other things, but yeah. some very nice attributes as well. The interesting part and unique about Visual Edge for Java is the source code was not a file. It was in a database. This was the, the, the unique thing about that. And uh, I don't know what they remember. What I don't like at all about Visual Edge for Java, I couldn't see the entire class. So um, you only could, you know, click on a method or field and you just saw, you know, the, the block, but it was impossible to, to, to my knowledge to, to see the entire thing. What I appreciated about Visual Edge for Java, it looked great. So actually how, how, how it looked, it was a fresh look at, at, at that, as what I remember, it was really nice look and feel how, how it looked like. And uh, working with it, it was, um, yeah, as you said, I think saving compiled the stuff. So this was also good. And uh, the problem we hit was uh, in larger project was the scalability of the entire system because uh, then if multiple users worked with a single database, this was a little bit problematic. But I think this Visual Edge for Java was really different and really interesting because it was completely different to Ball and JBuilder or things I knew before, right? Yes, it certainly was. Uh, and, and very, very interesting yeah, because they had their own version control built in at the method level for... What was the name? Uh, Envy, right? Envy was the I name, think I think. so, possibly. The engine, yes. But then you had a bit a of, of a mismatch mm -hmm. because if you were working on web projects, you couldn't store uh, assets in there. You couldn't store images and other things in that you could only okay. store source code. And then you needed some other solution on the side. At the time, there was not a lot. Like You, you had very primitive solutions like uh, Visual Source Save from Microsoft, which would... Yeah. Uh, so it, it, was, it was rather complicated. It was also built. Uh, it was um, built, or it was based on uh, small talk Correct. ideas, right? This was uh, exactly. This is why it was like like it was. Mm -hmm. But I, I knew people who were really, they just wanted to use Visual Edge for Java. They really liked that. And and uh, later came Eclipse, but it was not. It was somehow similar to Visual Edge for Java, but completely different, right? So. Yeah, Eclipse came then in two thousand and one. I think if I remember correctly, and, yeah. And uh, that kind of grew up out of the um, uh, the research labs in uh, Switzerland. Uh, where Eric Gamma, who had worked on the Patterns exactly. book and all that in the 90s, was working. And then uh, that um, there was open source, be an open source IDE was something very new at the time also. It was, uh, it was mm -hmm. really groundbreaking. And then the whole concept of uh, refactoring and early things that came in there were, was very, very interesting. The idea that you could build up so much more intelligence about the code and and, and and reason about it, uh, the tooling up to that point had been quite primitive, and this really opened the floodgates to a, a certain extent to, to much more modern tooling. So that was, uh, that was a very interesting development, but then um, yeah. a regression as well in terms of uh, the compiler in the beginning that, that improved yeah. afterwards uh, compared to Visual Edge. And millions of plugins, which I really hated, you know, because there were no two, two equal clients. Mm. So I had, you know, several instances of the IDE to 
per client one, which was crazy yes, back then. Indeed. But um, at IBM, so you were like an enterprise consultant, right? So you did the visual aid for Java, then maybe uh, M MQ series, right? There were I some guess. MQ series, uh, some DB2. Uh, yeah, the typical, because obviously most of the um, uh, projects IBM sold at the time uh, had to use as much uh, IBM technology as possible because they were making big money on all those licenses as well. And um, and yes, so we uh, we were uh, stuck with uh, uh, WebSphere as well with terrible startup times at the time because our machines were very underpowered. And these, even the early 2000s, you'd be lucky to have 64 megs of RAM. Like this was, yeah. uh, this was much different hardware story than, than what it is today. So that was... Um, yeah, the, uh, basically, yes. Yeah. So it was end-to-end uh, uh, -end IBM to a uh, tool chain. Yeah. Um, so what happened after IBM? So I moved to Germany. Um, I um, I worked as a consultant here for about uh, 15 months uh, uh, for some other company. Um, I actually never went to their uh, headquarters or offices at all. I just worked for that customer here in Munich. Um, and that was, that was very nice because... Um, First of all, it allowed me to have a foot in the door here in German society because the first uh, a business language there was English and I didn't speak a word of German at the time. So that was very convenient because then I could take intensive uh, lessons of German every Monday and I would practice on the computer with CDs, some program called Tell Me More at the time and then would kind of uh, do, do that. And after a few months, I got to the point where I could then... Uh, uh, force my colleagues to deal with my terrible German and they would have to kind of uh, suffer through that but that allowed me to progress rapidly and then um, so that was great there was good foot in the door here and again um, in terms of work um, it was also I was working on some projects with um, we had some web logic there um, we had some uh, different types of uh, J2EE type of uh, uh, technology stack, lots of uh, services talk talking to each other, uh, WSDLs to describe the interfaces, uh, the typical uh, um, mid uh, first decade of the 2000s type of technology. Mm -hmm. Okay, and 15 months because the company went out of business? No, absolutely not. Uh, 15 months because during that time I, um, I met a bunch of new people and uh, some of those were self-employed. And then I uh, basically looked at the salary I was making and I learned from them what they were charging the customer. And I thought we had more or less similar abilities and I didn't see any reason why uh, basically that uh, employer, which I never visited their offices, would take more than half of that for themselves. So I thought, well, bugger that. I think I can do it. And off I went uh, and became self-employed from there on. Oh, did you have self-employed from since two thousand five? Um, that was uh, so. I moved to Germany. I, I must have been mid uh, two thousand six, fifteen months, so we're uh, late two thousand and seven, something like that. There I became. Uh, no, no, interesting. So I was self-employed. So interesting. No, that I didn't knew that you are self-employed. Okay, and then you worked as consultant all, all these years. Yes, so I worked as a consultant for a few years, and eventually. So I, I, Which area? Uh, enterprise, uh, again. Enterprise thing, to exactly Java. the same thing as before. So I would have different customers. Um, so, um, many of them I would have via uh, some agencies. That would be the link mm -hmm. between you and the customers. They have a customer portfolio. And then yeah, they know some consultants. And then basically they take a 10-15% cut on whatever daily rate you're making. And then I would sign up for like three-month projects or six-month projects to help whatever customers in need. I, I try to um, always find companies that were within half an hour by bicycle from where I lived because I don't like to commute. So this is like the, the most uh, I wanted to do. And that worked well. I could, uh, could do that um, mm -hmm. as long as I needed to. So that was great. And um, yeah, during those years, I began attending also the first conferences, paid with my own money to attend different conferences just because I was uh, very hungry to learn as much as I could. Which conferences you attended back oh, then? I had, um, I, was um, I went to Java Polis, which uh, these days is uh, called DevOx in Belgium. Um, and uh, I went to QCon in London, which I thought was also very mm -hmm. interesting. That was uh, also a very different type of um, um, audience and talks and a bit more focused towards architecture. So that was... That was very interesting because I was about 10 years into my career at that point. This was a lot of topics I was getting mm -hmm. uh, involved with. So that, that, was, uh, that was great. 
And then gradually through those conferences, a feeling emerged in me where I thought, well, why are these guys on stage and why am I here? On some of those subjects, I feel I actually yeah. know at least as much as they do. So maybe I should do yeah. something about that. And, and that kind of culminated then at the end of that first decade of the 2000s where I thought, okay, let's, let's see what I can do. And I did my very first uh, um, talk at uh, the um, Java user group in Augsburg here in Germany at uh, 20 people in the audience. Uh, 10 of them were friends and colleagues, and I was super nervous. Uh, but, uh, but it was a great experience, and then kind of went from there. And that was, uh, that was really interesting. Which, what was the t title of your first talk? Oh, good question. Uh, I think it was Continuous Delivery, because I okay. um, got involved in that very early, and it really resonated with me because this is something that I'd been pursuing for a long time, uh, automating more and more pieces of the deployment. And when I, when I, when I saw the book and I, and I basically had chewed right through it, this was super interesting for me at the time. And I thought, all oh, right, they're really, they're piecing things nicely together. Some, a lot of things I'd already done before, but they had some nice other ideas to complement all that. And that, that really clicked to kind of have the whole puzzle come together. And, uh, and I was super enthusiastic about that. So that's... Uh, um, Which book was it? Right, the Continuous Delivery book? Yes, right? yes. The by, Continuous uh, Delivery book by uh, Dave Farley and Jess Humble. Yes. Yeah, Jess. Uh -huh. But this book was more or less high-level book, right? Yes, yes. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a book that stood the test of time also very well. We're 13 years or, or a bit more after its release now. And it's, uh, and it's still very current, which I think I appreciate a lot. Because when, you, when you're going to invest time to read a book, I think the, this investment, the hours that you'll put into that should, uh, should pay off for as long as possible. I've never been a real fan of the books that will describe version 2.3 of some specific technology yeah. and then they're out of date by the time they're published. And, uh, but, but those kind of books that talk about the principles behind our craft and our work, I think those are really timeless and are a good investment to, to dig into and, and read. Interestingly, because the CICD movement, for me, the, the only challenge was database. So what I what I liked uh, there was a book a book book called I think Agile Databases by uh, it was actually not that known book but it was by Kent Beck even mm -hmm. I think uh, it, Kent Beck or I would put it to show notes is um, Agile Databases and um, he talked or wrote about you know how to how to make um, for instance, uh, how to call it um, rollbacks in database possible. So how to deal with it. Because uh, for application servers, this was a solved problem. Even BA, I remember, had back then Jython, I think it was Jython API, to deploy applications. Mm -hmm. So you can always fully automate the entire application servers. And for me, it was normal that uh, we automate that, right? So what I remember, I was in a project with uh, Glassfish back then. And uh, the consultants opened, you know, the console, uh, I mean, the, the portal or the website, the admin admin website, uh, it was called console, but it was a website, to deploy the application. And I say, this, you are crazy. I mean, we can, we can have a CLI, a, a script which automates that because, you know, you went there, said, you know, uh, upload file, and they always, you know, picked the wrong file, and this was a huge mess. And I say, why are you doing this? It should be automated. So for me, it was like no brainer, right? So um, I, and I and I took a look at the book, but I say this is like self evident. We, I mean, we we are about automations because the computers are about automation. So everything has to be automated, right? No, I mean, and the only change was the database because what do you do with the database? This this was always the problem because everything else it doesn't matter because you know rolling updates very early. Glassfish was I think in two thousand six or seven. There was a company called Surly. His um, it was the name. They could have rolling updates. So what they could do, they can deploy, you know, new versions of applications during the old version is running. And for me, it was okay. We can do this, so no problem. This is already solved problem. There's load balancer which switches the traffic, so it was done. So interesting that you were so, you know, impressed by the book, because for me it was like, okay, we can talk about that or do it, right? So it was not like you learned what you learned in the book. This would be interesting, you know. What 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 was because we have to automate everything. Period. Right. And if this is like 
right? Yeah, I think it's a great summary. Yeah, I think uh, everything should be automated. No, I think what I liked about it was that it it basically combined a bunch of loose pieces that I had in my mind in one some some kind of cohesive structure where I thought, okay, that that really makes makes sense. Uh, and I'm sure there were the odd nuggets of knowledge sprinkled left and right where I thought, aha, uh -huh, that's interesting. I haven't thought about it that way, but it's. Again, I think we're uh, about 12 or 13 years since I read the book and I haven't reread it yeah. since. I just know that it made a very strong impression on me at, uh, at the time. Because I also read such books for different purpose often. Because if I would like you know, to achieve something in the project, it is a really bad idea somehow you know, to, to try to, to, to um, convince the clients to do this. right? So, but what is a bad idea? So, so I looked at a book and it talks about this. And if you, if you point to a book, which is a great book, then you have more chances to to succeed indirectly, you know, like guerrilla tactics. So I often you read, you know, clean code, whatever, to know what's in the book. But even the clean code book, there are some good nuggets. But it is it, it is if you you should just write, you know, try to to, to name things correctly and and write simple code. This is what 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 you should try to do. And 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 maybe you know at the beginning you are not so confident whether you do the right thing. And if you read, you know, a book, and the book restates what you already know this is a great you know speed up because it's okay this is right what i'm thinking just do it right so um very good so uh okay so interesting so your first talk was about a continuous delivery and um what happened then so there was um there was no flyway yet but i had been um well i had been diving into that area for a while and i had been working on some projects for fun as well at home at this thing because i told you I like traveling. So I built this little website where I could kind of, I went on a big cycling trip as well that year. I went, uh, I cycled the whole Danube from uh, the source in Germany to the Black Forest in uh, uh, in Romania to the, uh, uh, from the Black Forest in Germany to the Black, um, uh, Black Sea in Romania. So that was, uh, that was very nice. And I wanted a small website to basically um, um, write from on the road about my experiences. And I needed some kind of database there. I picked a MySQL database, uh, five dot, um, one, I think at the time or something like that. Um, and at some point, of course, as I'm developing this thing, I realized, well, geez, we got these, uh, structural changes. And up to that point, most of the projects I'd been working on that kind of, um, uh, separated all that. So you would have some SQL scripts in random state of, accuracy and uh, uh, that would be run or you, you'd have a set of individual statements that you'd run and be always a bit of a mess and, and brittle. And I thought that, well, there's got to be a better way. And Rails had come around a few years prior and they'd already introduced this this step with migrations with a Ruby DSL to uh, kind of do that. And then I looked around well, what's available in the JVM space and uh, Liquibase had just come around as well a, a year or two prior. So I looked at the XML and I thought, well, it's not really what I want because I don't want, I want to think in SQL, like the database is. Yeah. I don't want an intermediate layer where I have to translate in my head from uh, what will actually be output and what will there, because in most projects, the data will survive the code. So this is the thing that exactly. really uh, should be focused on and, and should be clean. And so I looked and there were some projects. Wait, wait a second, Axel. You said right, uh, right now, data will survive the code. Is this your saying? You heard it somewhere? Because I say the same. So you you know for for different from different contexts. So people try you know back then create DAOs or uh, data access objects to and to to decouple from a database. And I say my observation is actually so that database outlives the Java code. So there is no reason to being you know to to encapsulate or decouple from database because uh, if something changes your code, not necessarily the database. And you said the first time the same. So it was like your observation or was it like a, another book you read? Or no, no, where you have first you know, hand the... observation. Uh, I've uh, had this on, on many projects in the consultancy years that I did, uh, where even just um, changing a system, like we had systems in PHP that uh, um, were totally outdated that we had to move to the JVM. Well, what stuck around? The database, of course. Yeah, and, exactly. Or between different generations of technology on the JVM, the database stuck around, the code got thrown away and rewritten. Um, so exactly it, yeah, my observation. Just, this is why it's not just a saying. It, that's the truth. We still have, you know, convinced us in some code reviews, you know, developers, you don't really have to decouple, you no, know, have to mappers between the entities and whatever, and decouple from a database because uh, the database is usually the master, right? So, very good. Uh huh. So you started with, um, so and this was my suspicion that you knew about migrations in Ruby. 
because they started the very first time. So, do you know, the creating the database was a central part of Rails. Right. And, uh, and, and okay, you know about migration. What, what I did back then, I used JPA and some providers like Eclipse Link or Hibernate had a Pullman version, you know, of dealing with it. And um, yeah, interesting. So, um, and and you try to replicate uh, migrations or, you know, create something from scratch? Yes. So I wasn't very happy with the uh, uh, Ruby DSL. I really thought this should be something that should be done in SQL. So I looked around on the market and there were some projects. I think one was called C5DB Migrations, if I remember it correctly. And they were doing some of that in SQL and I was going in the right direction, but there was enough that wasn't the right fit for what I had in mind that I would have had to convince the maintainers of um, a change of direction and submit so many patches that I thought, but at the time, the tool's still primitive. I can just do it better myself. Mm -hmm. And that kind of became the embryo of what later uh, became Flyway because I had this then for my own little travel uh, reports we website. And then I had a customer where... After I began giving all these talks on continuous delivery, they, they were quite keen on, or they were mm -hmm. willing to kind of embark on that journey to automate everything because they were coming from mm -hmm. the world you were describing where people were picking an individual file on an application server, deploying that and uh, error prone and so on. And so we, we embarked on that journey there very early in 2010 to fully automate everything. And, of course, the database became a thing there as well. And they had an Oracle database. My code was for MySQL at home. And I thought, well, what do I do? Do I just um, copy it over, give them all the IP, and then I'll kind of go? Or how, where, where will that go? And then eventually I thought, well, this open source thing, it um, sounds like fun. Again, a bit for this uh, gum style. I didn't really have a clue, but I thought, yeah, well, why not? Let's give it a try. And there was Google Code at the time where you could host uh, repositories and something called Mercurial, which was an alternative to what we yeah, exactly. get today. Mm -hmm. And um, and that seemed fun. And the Apache 2 license seemed all right uh, in terms of what you could do with it and the rights you're granting. So I thought, well, let's just uh, move that to Google Code and add the necessary abstractions to make it work both in MySQL and in Oracle. And then basically had that customer as uh, the, the very first user of that. And and then we just kind of went from there. You designed the logo from beginning. Ah, no, uh, I had it in mind, but I'm uh, I'm terrible. I've got two left hands. I can't draw. So the first logo, I, uh, I um, uh, for those that don't know, it doesn't look entirely like that on the website these days anymore, but uh, it was a hand-drawn logo uh, of a cylinder and some wings. And I had to convince my exactly. wife, uh, who actually drew it, I told her, you know, this is really what a database looks like. Trust me, and add some wings to that because uh, the word "flyway" is a, a rather uncommon English word that basically uh, it means the migration part for birds that will migrate from one continent to the other. Ah, and that okay. is the flyway. And I thought that was very suitable for the kind of uh, job it was doing. And then so we added a, a database with wings, and then that became uh, the logo. This would be the next question: Why Flyway to be? And and you and you had the name from the yes, beginning, I had right? The name was from the, the name. beginning. Um, yes, and then the logo uh, was drawn on paper. I scanned it. I filled in uh, the colors with flood fill and Microsoft Paint, and uh, that was that. Yes, so that's uh, that was cool. the expensive logo design. And um, I suppose the first version was like a JDBC, right? Where uh, you read some, maybe it was even hard coded with MySQL, and then you externalize it with text files, right? So the very first version, um, yes, I, um, I think the first version of the open source project did have the Oracle and MySQL abstraction already in there. It was a very mm -hmm. simple loop that would uh, uh, kind of loop over some directory and then look at whatever SQL files. And then I think the naming convention came rather early. I think there was no description in the beginning, just a number or something simple uh, so that there would be a way to sort it. And then a very... Um, simple version of what later became the schema version history table uh, where we would record what had happened and that would run there. So, yeah. And that foundation kind of carried on till today. It's, of course, much more sophisticated and all that, but the basic mechanism yeah. is still the same. Because you have one like metadata table where it stores the versions and all the metadata, which uh, the state but Correct. Of, of the system, right? Okay. And was it successful from the beginning or how you promote it or what happened? How I mean, what, what, how successful was it? Day one, day two, maybe next week or what happened? Mm, 
almost zero in the beginning. It was very quiet. There would okay. be the occasional download, whether it was a bot or a real human, I don't know, but the counter went up, but very slowly, like five, 10 downloads mm -hmm. in a month, maybe a month with 20 after a while, like they slowly, slowly went. But of mm -hmm. course, a snowball takes a while to, to get rolling. So no overnight success, but then nothing is. And um, what was important is that gradually feedback began coming in where users said, well, we're actually using this now for Oracle and we need a bit of a description because we have more files and we can't read that. Or we, uh, uh, we have some Postgres here. Wouldn't you support that? Or we have SQL Server. And so gradually the feature set driven by the requests of the users began expanding to cover more databases, more edge cases, more uh, special bits of functionality. Why you had to support multiple databases? Because uh, to my knowledge, you know, the, the SQL statements, there's the complete create statements or update statements or whatever. So why, why you had to be aware of databases at all back then? Well, um, there's subtle differences. Uh, there's subtle differences in how the databases work. Some have a concept of a schema. Others do not. Mm -hmm. Some uh, have uh, different data types that are needed to support in that one table with a history. And the uh, DDL for that oh. one table would be quite oh, okay. different as well. Uh, sometimes the query for that table would be would have subtle differences because things would not work, or the quoting would be different, different marks and all that. So that even though SQL is a standard, it's different enough that you, yeah, you couldn't have one size fits all. The problem was your schema table, right? Uh, the the yes. metadata table. This is the only problem. Uh, primarily, yes, yes. Yeah. So you could keep the state in Git or whatever, there would be no problem at all. There but... were some other things, like later the clean functionality, for example, was very database specific, enumerating all the objects in the database to find out. Ah, yeah, exactly. JDBC metadata, right? Yeah, so, so you I have, have to, to be the expert the information in information yeah. schema, which sometimes is called differently as different tables and so on. So that. Uh... Yeah. Okay. I understand now. Cool. Um, and, and was it a point of time where it really became popular or was it just you know, a gradual gr gradual? Nothing ever went overnight, but it always kind of doubled, tripled, quadrupled every year. And so it started small and then it just went and went and went. And of course, it looks like a hockey stick, but, but if, in terms of percentages, it was quite the same every year. It was like yeah. times four or something. And then, yes, it uh, it's like the... Uh, um, the, the proverb with the king and the chessboard and uh, you have to put one grain of rice on the first one and then two on the second square and so on. And by the time you've got exponent 64, it's kind of, it's not doable anymore. So, uh, so yeah, so it just, it just grew from there. Uh, so how long it took until it become really noticeable? So uh, I would say five years, right? So I would say if you... It took a few years, yes. Uh, um, so to get back to your earlier question of how I promoted it in the beginning, it didn't just kind of have the project there. I, uh, um, Stack Overflow had become a thing uh, about a, a year or two before. I think maybe in 2009, Jeff Atwood and uh, Joel Spolsky started that, I think, in that summer there. Um, so I had an account there. It took me a while to be able to get enough points to be able to create a tag and then have that. But there were already other questions where I didn't need a tag, where uh, people had been asking about database migrations and different tools. And so I could answer those and then put some links uh, that would refer back to the Google code page or to some solutions or database specific pages there or some documentation page. I also searched the Internet for blogs where people had been discussing that and left comments left and right uh, about, hey, by the way, these days there is a solution out there that does the problem or does solve the problem you described there. And that, that was like the early marketing that I, that I did to be able to uh, uh, attract some attention. And you wanted to earn money with it or what was your motivation? I, I told you I first jumped into it. I had no clue what I was doing for the longest time. And it just grew and grew and grew and grew. And then at some point, maybe a couple of years in, I tried... I thought, okay, this is becoming a problem. Like I'm, I'm having a lot of work to maintain this and it's eating up because I'm still doing consultancy five days a week. So it's eating up my nights and my weekends. And it would be nice if there would be some kind of return from that. So I tried different things. Um, and the, the early attempts were um, uh, some su uh, support contracts uh, with uh, just for the open source thing. And... Um, paid, paid feature development, where I would have some uh, features in the in the backlog, and companies could then sponsor the development of those features. But that 
really didn't go anywhere. I think I got like five support contracts or so in total, so that not enough, like a bit of pocket yeah. money, but it's uh, no, uh, not enough to live on. And then the paid features, that was all right, made some money with that, but um, yeah, it's a one-off. And then I'm still stuck with yeah. maintaining that for uh, forever going forward and, and the additional complexity of the product. So that um, that wasn't really sustainable either. So but, but though, there was, let's say a few years in, they began to, to uh, pressure began developing to uh, uh, to make it sustainable because at some point it was not sustainable anymore to keep this large project uh, around just by myself. Okay, um, maybe to the listeners we should briefly introduce what how FlywayDB is working, right? What it does. So uh, you specify SQL files as they are, right? They are directly targeted to the database, no abstraction. This is, by the way, what I really like about FlywayDB. Because the liquid base, the, the use case would be you have like an abstract language and this is translated to a target DB. But as I said, in my projects, we had only one DB, so there was no reason to abstract from it. And um, and then you can run it. Uh, I used Maven, but it could be just a jar. And I think even on Android, you can run it, right? It was even supported by Android, uh, Opera, uh, Android uh, OS. And uh, basically, you get like migrations in, in race, right? So you could, um, there, there was, for me, it was always a specific task or yeah, a task in the CI CD pipeline. Mm -hmm. This is what we did. So we have a dedicated task for FlywayDB and for products on application servers, we had like a startup process and the startup process did it because there was no, if you, if you deliver a product, you start, you know, the application server and the expectation was the database was set up. So there was a difference. So in products, we use the startup procedure of application servers, even startup annotation. And in projects, we had a dedicated stage. So I hope I used it correctly, right? Was also on your mind like this or? Yes. Yeah, so if you come from the Rails world, that you have this step during deployment where you will you will do that. And yeah. Flyway didn't bring a lot of innovations uh, to the table, really. If you look at the industry as a whole, like it uh, just had mm -hmm. the plain SQL thing. But I think the the other thing, and that's maybe the tiny, tiny little bit of innovation that Flyway did bring, was to run the um, uh, encourage running the migrations on application startup, where you programmatically mm -hmm. would invoke invoke it so that you could bundle all the migrations together into your deployment artifact and then that you could throw it at any environment you wanted and the database could be in any state and it would be migrated automatically when uh, it would start to the desired state or the required state of the application so i think that's a tiny bit of innovation that uh, that flyway did there and and i'm very happy with that because that really stuck around and, and got adopted very very widely oh interesting so um i had i had the feeling that what i'm doing with on startup deployment is more like a hack and the cleaner solution was, you know, the CI/CD hack. What we did for the projects, but you, what you are saying, you know, my my second uh, uh, idea that uh, it should happen at the application startup was actually the more common one, which is actually pretty cool. Yes, the reason I wanted that is because as soon as you have two separate steps, there it's a but a potential mistake that can happen where you do one, not the other, or you do them in the wrong order. And if you have just a single step for deployment that takes care of everything automatically and you can't make any mistakes anymore, then you just eliminate a whole class of potential errors. And so that's Yeah, you're right. Because you are also idempotent, right? Even if it happens you know, on two Correct. nodes. Uh, it, so you can always so the, the... safely run it, always. And it'll just say, okay, I'm up to date, that's fine. Or yes, I got to do migrate to version six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and now you're good to go. But there were no concurrency issues. So if you would have two nodes which do this at the same time. So this was again driven by those customer um, uh, feedback things early on, where yes, okay, we've got a cluster and it's all starting at the same time, and we, and so very early on, uh, the whole concept of locking that central table with some select for updates and then making sure that only one node would be able to perform the migrations was introduced into the tool and to the core of the tool so that basically one node sees the database as out of date, the other has to wait. The node that saw the database as out of date will perform migration and release the lock and then the other sees, oh, the database is up to date and we're fine and then it's good. So that's... Uh, oh, almost like, what you explain is almost like two-phase commit sounds like now from outside. It's all, almost right. So a, like, a little bit simpler, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, simpler, but uh, okay. And and then you basically sold the solution in one point of time, right? You Yes. Um, so the um, the big inspiration there so um, came in a, 
around 2016 there was um there was this comp uh, there's this website online called indie hackers which is uh, .com it's a community for uh, entrepreneurs uh, that one man companies two man companies five man companies um in the internet space that have solutions out there and they they have uh, it's very interesting they have interviews with different founders and you can sort by industry and by revenue and I found some guy there in the Ruby space as well, working on some open source uh, project um, called Sidekick. And he was facing a similar dilemma to what I was. And eventually he decided, okay, he needs to go commercial for the sustainability of the project and to have an open core model where he would have the existing functionality open source and add a pro and an enterprise edition. And within four years of um, doing that transition, he was uh, making a million dollars a year by himself. And so I thought, well, that's very interesting. Let's read that again. And I thought, well, let's do it. And so it took a lot of work because, again, I was very naive when I entered that. So I just accepted pull requests left and right. And so and it took me about a year to um, chase all the existing contributors to uh, basically clean up the IP and ask them whether they would like their, um, to um, uh, give me the rights to their contribution or if they would prefer to have their contribution removed. And so I think about 95, 97% said yes, and then some said no, and that was okay. And then we removed that. And and then... Uh, what did it, you removed and rewrote it? or um, It, was it just depends. Uh, some support for some more exotic databases um, I removed because I didn't have okay. a test environment, yeah. just dropped it. I thought, if you want to use that, just stay on the old version. That's okay. And then... Um, some things I rewrote when it was just two or three lines of code and I could just rewrite that. Uh, uh, but yes, yeah, so I, I had to do a lot of that. And then by that time, the project had been around for six or seven years. So I could I had a nice backlog in the issue tracker also of which features I thought would not be relevant for the hobbyists at home or the small project or people with little money, but would be very relevant for billion dollar companies. And I thought, well, let's package those in a in a pro and an enterprise edition and put a price tag on that. Um, I, it wasn't easy to figure out how to price it because who prices a development library in a small tool? Like there's there's yeah. not a big market for, for that, especially in open source. And, and in that space, uh, I came up in the, with the idea to price it by schema. I thought, well, it seems reasonable because by developer, it's kind of awkward when you de deploy it in production, what the developer is there, how size of your team changes over time. Complicated, so I thought, okay, let's price it by schema. And um, then I just copied the prices of uh, Psychic uh, because I thought, well, they've been doing that for a while, that's okay. Um, they had this entry price of $950 a year, and they justified it by being below the approval threshold for credit card expenses at the team level in a lot of companies in America. Okay. It's maybe a thousand. So I thought, well, that makes sense, let's go for that. And then I thought, well, let's ask three times as much for the enterprise edition and offer support for databases for longer and uh, offer support in uh, more languages for email support. And then we'll, we'll just see where that goes. And that, that went very well. Though in the, the first month, I had no idea. So I launched that early December, 2017. And I didn't know, is this going to be, am I going to get a big shit storm? Because I uh, dare to ask money uh, for uh, the software will this be okay? Will it not? And turned out it made thirty thousand dollars in the first month, and it in recurring revenue, and just kept on growing from there. So that was that was really incredible. Okay, but uh, I thought that you, you sold the complete solution, or was it? Yes. So eventually, so that took off like a rocket ship, and that um, did attract some attention. And uh, eventually, in uh, um, eighteen month, eighteen months later, uh, we were at the point where. Uh, I had uh, a, a buyer that was, that was interested, uh, Redgate, and then we um, agreed on some terms and uh, we, we, uh, we proceeded with the sale. Was, uh, so you are now no more a master of FlowerDB, right? Correct. So correct. you are just okay. enthusiastic. This was, um, so the, this, uh, there was the option of sticking around or not, but I, I'd been independent for so long at that point. Um, I couldn't have a boss anymore. That's just not possible yeah. anymore. I, I couldn't yeah. deal with that. So I said, no, we'll do a transition and and I'll help you and we'll, we'll do everything so that you can then uh, carry the torch forward from there. But I'm not sticking around long term. 
do the tra transition and, and that's it. And, and yeah. that was okay for them and that's what we did. Interesting that you, you pick Sidekick because Sidekick is uh, was actually a really popular project and I think it's the messaging, messaging solution for Ruby. Messaging or job scheduling, Correct. right? Correct, background job scheduling, yes. Back, back, okay. uh, no, messaging also as well, or just the background? Because this is it is used a lot. It's closely you know? related, of course, because to be able to, uh, you put your things in a queue and then they get picked up by workers. And exactly, that, so, yeah. exactly. Okay, interesting. Okay, cool. So what do you do, Axel? So um, this is a cliffhanger now. I would like to talk about the uh, your captain stuff, right, as mm -hmm. well, after the Flower DB. So I will re-invite you back just to talk about, you know, exclusively about your next idea, what you are doing. Okay. And uh, for me, it was uh, super interesting, you know, to 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 hear the backgrounds about FlywayDB because for me it was a really interesting project. I followed this closely, and um, and um, I also recommended to many of my clients, if not all. And uh, and uh, what I like about that that this is basically a Java library. You know, this is for like very simple solution, which I really appreciate the simplicity, uh, no magic, and uh, you can embed it, you can use it in Maven or whatever. And um, and now we know the back backgrounds, and I think. A few weeks ago, I reviewed um, an enterprise project, and they also use FlywireDB, so it still lives. Yeah, yeah, I think it's uh, it's doing very well, and and I agree with you on the simplicity. This was always something I've I've always had a strong dislike for libraries that pull in a huge amount of transitive dependencies, and you have to pull in half the world. And I liked a very focused solution, and and I think yeah. Flyway really achieved that very well of having just one tiny little brick that you could plug into your Lego structure, and it would just kind of work. And this is now funny because I like application servers because of that. So the, I didn't care what the application service is doing. Uh, by the way, I didn't like the WebSphere Classic. This was really a problem because it put it in 40 Absolutely. minutes. But yeah, but um, I use um, Glassfish a lot, Whitefly, JBoss, Open Liberty, which is great from IBM. Now Quarkus, Micronaut a bit, and Helidon. And uh, what I like the most of the application servers, if you build your project, your app, there are absolutely no dependencies. So in my projects, we only had, you know, the Java EE API and nothing else. And I was very strict, you know, to remove whatever it was not Java EE and it worked perfectly over the years. So at the beginning, I heard, you know, it is not possible to build such apps and we did it all the time and it worked and it still works. And what I appreciate about your solution. So your solution was not part of the deployment API usually, and if it, it was uh, part of the pipeline, and if it was shipped as application, then of course we needed the, the, the library, but it was not like di direct, you know, it was a very, maybe two liner, I forgot the code, you know, Flyway DB, whatever, mm -hmm. run, and, and this basically what it was in the post construct startup. So um, there was the, the mindset was very, very similar. This is what I really appreciated. So there was no abstraction, just, you know, a, a very useful library. Yeah. Uh, and everything was. Um... Um, with defaults so that you didn't have to configure as much. Convention of a configuration. Another yeah. thing which I really appreciate about FlywayDB and Java e as well, mm -hmm. right? So at the, at the end, Java e, I don't know what they are aware, JPA, you have a class, put entity, a f all fields are persistent by default. There, there's a very lean code and this is what I really, really ap appreciated the most. And the next time, I would like to talk about Cloud Captain, right? Yeah, I have actually uh, have a few more things on the burner now. So uh, yeah, I can't wait to, to talk to you about it. Yeah, and the next time, very focused on on your burner, right? <laughs> so let's see what the what, what your burner is do doing. Yes, absolutely. So where people can find you? So do you ever know some where you can follow your current project? So yes, give me some. so um, so I'm on Twitter at uh, axelfontaine.com. I don't post very mm -hmm. often, but I, but I'm there, and uh, um, uh, I've got a GitHub account as well, and I've got the axelfontaine.com website where you can find all my contact details if you uh, if you want to get in touch and. Uh, Yes, and then we'll talk about the new projects uh, the next time we, we speak. Thank you. It was a pleasure to meet you and to have you know, dedicated one hour with yes, you. Yes, um, the pleasure was mine. Thank you very much for organizing this.